Today we have on China Talk, David Fung, Twitter's favorite China trains expert. David, welcome to China Talk. Mind introducing yourself? Thank you for having me. I'm David Feng, and yes, I do tweet a lot about trains, mainly uh, high-speed rail, uh, classic rail, metros, and uh, trams. At David Feng. Wonderful. Some kids are bridge kids. Some kids are car kids. When did you know trains were for you? The funny thing was, I started out life as being a car kid, and、uh, I was like really interested in the more geeky parts of cars, like the the old Beijing buses, the the gears, the transmissions, and stuff like that. And about at the age of five, I took the Beijing subway, and I was like quite interested, because the I went down to the tube with the family, and we did an interchange. I think at Fuxing Main Station from the Loop Line, which is now Line Two to Line One, and what left me a really deep impression was like the trains were just simply. Completely red, and I was like, "Wow, that is a real color." Sc- Fast forward two <laughs> years, that's like about、uh, seven years old. That was when I made it to Switzerland at the ages of six and seven, and I went on trains in the northeastern part of Switzerland, and I just found it to be really amazing—the scenes and everything like that as well. So, David, take us back to the Qing Dynasty. What was the train situation there, and how did it evolve through、uh, to 1949? I'm like a high speed. Sort of person since 2008, I've taken a look at how trains were like about a couple centuries back. The Qing Dynasty was basically when China was like opening up, whether it liked it or not. And、uh, they, I think, if I'm not mistaken, they built first train lines in Beijing. Back then, it was called Peking and、uh, Eastern China. I think the Wuzong Railway as well. Back in the day, it was like mainly built by foreign powers. China did not really get its own. Chinese-made railway line until like about 1905 with the Imperial Peking to Kalgan Railway. So back in the day, the Qing Dynasty, the Emperor and these guys, they they like sort of ambivalent. When the first like rail line opened in、uh, Peking back then, people in the Imperial Court were caught off guard. They were really scared. There was like, what the heck was this thing roaring, <laughs> producing smoke? So basically, it was not the kind of same. Uh, I would say more celebrated starts, for example, on the Metropolitan Railway in London. It was like two quite rather different worlds. Things started to change around, I think, when the Imperial Peking Kalgan Railway was built, because that was the first time the train line was built pretty much by Chinese people only. Didn't yeah, the the British expedition to see the Kangxi Emperor bring like a train set? I think they did、this? bring in like a train set. If I re- remember it well, it was like called the Rocket of China. So yeah, yeah, I think they started out very early on with、uh, train sets and like train lines.、Uh, to this date, the、uh, if you take a train from Tangshan South Railway Station, you're pretty much traveling from one of the oldest railway stations on mainland China, and、uh, pretty much traveling on some of the oldest train tracks as well. So there's a、uh, local service from Tangshan South to. If you travel on that service, you're pretty much traveling back in history. Very cool. Yeah. All right. So take us up through the through the Republican era and the and the Civil War. So basically,、uh, when Sun Yat-sen decided to create the、uh, Republic of China, one of the first things that on his pretty much on his mind was to expand the transport network. And obviously, the, you know, the whole transport network, the、uh, railways, was like a very big element.、Uh, he had some grandiose plans, some of which were just merely、uh, starting to fulfill, like about、uh, a century or more onwards. He was well ahead of his times, but the first thing to do, I think, was simply to get like a nationwide railway network running because we had, I think, was it the French that built the route from Vietnam to Kunming? So you can only take the train to leave China. You couldn't really take the train anywhere else in China if you were like back in Yunnan back in the days. So that was a very odd situation. Yunnan did not really get its own high-speed rail connection until like about, I think, was it 2016. So it was pretty much.、Uh, Lagging behind by about eight years, but going back to the、uh, days of the、uh, Republic of China, it was compared to the modern day network. It was far smaller, but it was already starting to be built and expanded a lot more. And I think after 1949, they put in a lot of effort on building new lines. For example,、uh, through really、uh, challenging ter- terrains, I'd say the Baoji to Chengdu line was one of the most challenging lines built. Linking the、uh, province of Shanxi with the、uh, southwestern Chinese province of Sichuan, so that was a ni- late 1950s railway line, and they started building out more and more. Do you want to take us up to? Why don't you just take us、uh, up to Gautier, and then we'll and then we'll jump in with that. Yeah, I would like to like、uh, dab and dab between the old and the new. Taking Gautier, the high speed network, pretty much as like a reference point. Because the high speed network is built pretty much the eight by eight network is pretty much built superimposed on the current、uh, classic rail network. 
afterwards, especially in the 1980s, ridership on the railways was like really going up. So uh, for quite a few decades, they started expanding Classic Rail. But then they realized that merely speeding up trains and getting new rolling stock wasn't going to be it. And they had to build complete new high-speed lines as a result. Most of us know the Shanghai Maglev from uh, Pudong Airport to Longyang Road, but most of us don't understand why it's so short. That was because it was like the first stretch between two stations on a line which was expected to go all the way to the World um, Expo site in 2010, as well as uh, even to Hangzhou East Railway Station and another branch off to Shanghai. Let's talk yeah. about you know, the technology and the interaction between foreign companies and, and Chinese domestic ones in the initial rollout of high-speed rail in China. The rollout of high-speed rail, we started with imported train sets. That's something that uh, the official rail people don't really like to acknowledge so much. But actually, we had a Swedish train set, I think, that ran as the X2000. And that Swedish train set, which I think has been returned to Sweden, I th- ran between Guangzhou and Shenzhen, clocked up to pretty much close to 200 kilometers per hour. This was the early 2000s. And uh, it was a very new service, running all the way to the uh, frontier, the border with Hong Kong. And so basically back then already in southern China, they really started taking interest in running high-speed railway trains. That was imported. They tried to do a local train set, the China Star. That didn't work. And then in uh, the early to mid twenty uh, hundreds, they started like thinking about importing train sets. Obviously, the imported ones were the CRH one, two, three, and five trains. And uh, CRH one, I think, was imported. I think pretty much from Canada, like much a bomb year work. CRH two was outright Japanese, the Shinkansen. CRH three was the Valsian, pretty much from uh, the German Intercity Express. And CRH five is the Pendolino from I think pretty much Italy and built pretty much by the people at Alstom. The Swiss actually have the same train set running between uh, the German speaking part and the Italian speaking part, the Ticino. So the two train sets look pretty much the same on the outside. <laughs> so this was like in the early to mid 2000s when they started thinking about building high speed. And the thing back then was they had to like market the high speed route in a way that central government wouldn't really oppose. To build those new train lines, they had to convince the uh, people in central government, especially the National uh, Commit- uh, Commission for uh, Development and Reform. They weren't so much high-speed railway lines as actually passenger-dedicated lines. And once mm. the terminology was pretty much made, you know, made there, they were going to be built up as uh, passenger-only lines. Then central government said, "Okay, you can build that. We need to get passenger trains off the classic rails and onto their own bit of a rail. And then it was through this geeky terminology twist that the current 4x4 and now 8x8 high-speed railway network really began to take off. So most of the money for this, for the, for this massive rollout comes in response to the Great Recession and the stimulus following that? At the very start, they started building out uh, a few key strategic routes, rather, with Beijing to Tianjin, the high-speed intercity line. They started with the Beijing to Hong Kong, really Beijing and Guangzhou line, but they built it, you know, but they built it from south and north. So Guangzhou north, Guangzhou south got a line to Wuhan, which would then be expanded by Zhengzhou to Beijing further north in the course of about three or four years time. And so basically it was a sort of like skeletal network to start with, but the great recession in the late 2000s really did accelerate the development of high speed. And so like back then we had an expanded 4x4 network in the planning, which would be realizable by the year 2020. Sure. So how did these, how did the Western technologies compete with each other and which brands ended up winning? And how did the relationship between the foreign firms and the Chinese train builders change over time? I think they started working together and one of the most important things was like technology transfer and to run the trains under a Chinese brand. In this case, the branding would rather be China Railways High Speed CRH, which is why you see lots of trains pretty much with the CRH logo. So that was the Chinese branding. But I think at the same time as the train started rolling around China and the fact was they chose many different manufacturers. Some of these had trains suitable for one part of the network, others had it ready for the other part. Like for example, the CRH3 trains were more ready for the frozen up north, northern China, northeastern China, whereas the CRH2 trains were more designed for like central and southern China. So it it all depended on the geographies. Uh, Also, the CRH5 is seen a lot during en routes which run through very cold parts of like northern and northeastern China. 
So they decided to get trains for different geographies from different manufacturers, and eventually, in the early 2010s, develop home-built improved versions. And these would be the second generation of the CRH Harmony Express trains before they went fully local with the CR Revival Express trains. That's the Fuxinghao ones, which we have today. I think basically what we had、uh, in the early 2000s was we had a few trains which were outright imported. The other ones were like assembled locally or simply built locally. Those were the old CRH one, two, three, and five trains. And then afterwards, we had the CRH three eighty trains, which were like the old trains, but they had a far more localized element. They were built pretty much within China. They were pretty much improved versions of the old trains. In some circumstances, they were like speeded up a lot more. So the three eighty A L trains, which was like the improvement on the CRH two trains, had a version of a train with fourteen carriages having electrical motors. And only two trailer trains. What this basically means is that this train is bloody fast, and in fact, it was it remains the fastest train in commercial operation during a test. That train clocked to four hundred eighty six point one kilometers per hour, way over three hundred miles per hour、Jesus. in late twenty ten <laughs> on a test run. What is your sense of the foreign manufacturers' sort of response to all of this? I imagine they were going in eyes open that this was the eventual aim of Chinese industrial policy to get domestic manufacturers to be the ones really pulling most of the weight five, ten years down the road. I, I think we're pretty much barking up the right tree because we had like about a couple of、uh, train sets, and we were then looking at okay, how to improve this kind of train set, how to improve that kind of train set. So by the time the Revival Express, the Fuxinghao came out in twenty. Was it seventeen? So basically, by then we had a、uh, train which encompassed the very best of the, I would say, over five different train sets we had back in a day, because they had like many different versions. So basically, they started like saying, "Okay, we got eight different forms of trains,、uh, train sets. Let's now pick the very best of all of these eight and make it pretty much ours." So that's pretty much how the new revival trains came to be, and that's why the revival trains. Are real runners. They are the ones that can do two seventeen mph, two three fifty kilometers per hour, because they've been built from the ground up to be the best of a whole pack. Some of the older trains, like the old、uh, C trains, the CL trains, had quite. They took quite a while to leave stations and to really accelerate up. But the new revival trains go really quick at the start when they leave a train station. So you get things like that. And then they say, "Okay, let's take this part of that train, that part of that train, make it ours, make it better, and keep on making it better." That's pretty much the train of thought, so to speak, that they that they're doing right now. David, can you walk us through what caused the Wenzhou crash in 2011, and what was the fallout from that event? I think the general consensus is、uh, is pretty much、uh, signaling pretty much the main issue、uh, to do with the horrific crash on 23rd of July 2011, when 40 people died. The rail industry in China took this extremely seriously. The fallout was pretty much、uh, abysmal. We had,、uh, I think, was it Wang Yuping, the rail spokes spokesperson, Wang Yuping, the rail spokes, you know, spokesperson, appearing pretty much. The things he said on live television was like really didn't resonate with the、uh, ridership, with the general population on and off trains. And so it was just a really ugly event in the history of Chinese railways. Everyone from onboard crew to train manufacturers, they were like, really, everyone was hit by this, and they were like in total shock that this thing could have happened. And today, it remains something that they think, let's have this never ever happen again, ever. So they learned a lot of lessons from this. Unfortunately, the fallout. Also hit the hit the rail network, which was being expanded at the moment, and then like quite a few lines got downgraded. There was a strategic route from Chengdu to Xi'an, or was it from Xi'an to Chengdu, which was primed for three fifty kilometers per hour. That got you no, know, that got downgraded to two hundred fifty kilometers per hour. There was another very strategic route from Xi'an to to Lanzhou, Xi'an Baoji to Lanzhou, Baoji to Lanzhou, and that was another one that was primed for three fifty kilometers per hour. In future for、uh, future revisions, and this one got bumped down to 250 kilometers per hour, and we saw a lot of downgrades in station design and station. Basically, back then stations were built as small as they could be, with not the very best of materials. So to be quite honest, the rails were pretty much in some pretty deep financial distress. It was just 
These were the ugly years from 2011 to 2013. These were some pretty bad years. Where should we go from here? I think once we get through that, then it's pretty much uh, a response from Beijing and I think also from the ridership that in spite of the Wenzhou crash, it was pretty much impossible to build back the network to get rid of high speed. People had started relying on high speed despite the controversy, the, despite the, contra- the controversy, despite the crash. People didn't like to part ways with high speed. They took it for a convenience that they started really getting used to. And I think after that, around late 2013, early 2014, slowly we saw the network being re-expanded at a faster, better better pace. Uh, new lines were now approved for 350 kilometers per hour, in some cases, as of late, even faster. And uh, things started getting better afterwards. So take us up through 2020. Yeah, so basically around 2014, 2015, that was when the railways learned a big lesson from the rail crash and uh, they made efforts in a few ways although they did not speed trains up in fact they lowered the maximum permitted speeds of trains from 350 kilometers per hour to 300 kilometers per hour just around the time of the crash some before some after the what they did do was a huge improvement in terms of passenger rail services we now have e-ticketing but few would actually know that the real e-ticketing foundations were laid in the mid-2000, in the mid-2010s, before the new system got introduced in around 2019. And another thing that was done after the uh, crash, although not so much related to to it as something that was basically going to be happening anyway, was that the uh, central government's Ministry of Railways was disbanded and uh, split into... uh, Basically, long-term planning given to the Ministry of Transport, admin duties and oversight given to the new National Railway Administration, and uh, operations handed over to the new China Railway Corporation, and this happened around 2013. So structural reform meant that the railways was no longer a direct arm of the central government, and um, things started getting modernized. One of the first things we saw was that you could now finally stick ads on board train sets, because previously they were just direct (laughs) government property. So uh, things started getting a bit more... Uh, what, it's, it's not just so much we had more ads. In fact, some found the ads to be quite uh, irritating. But I think in terms of like customer services and it's slowly eventually expanding the network, we did see quite a lot of that being done after 2013. Very cool. So David, talk a little bit about the Chinese firms now going out and helping build trains around the world. That's been happening like about a few recent... Uh, Yes, like one of the uh, case studies would be China Laos and also the uh, line from Bandung to Jakarta, as well as a few lines over in Africa. Especially back a few years back, these were like the rail projects that the Chinese rail industry were pretty much happy with, proud. They were like the very best and the very newest of the Chinese rail system being exported overseas, hopefully helping local communities. It's been a kind of controversy amongst some of these rail lines part of the Belt and Road initiative, but you take a look at it at the end of the day, and I don't think whilst we guarantee any sort of like immediate miracle, I think they at least aren't that destructive. They're they're certainly not here uh, to make things worse. I think, in fact, rail transport is probably one of the greener ways to get from A to B. And so eventually this is going to pretty much, especially the lines out from uh, Kunming to Laos, that's going to build up a uh, southern and south southeastern China, well, not just Chinese, but southern and southeastern Asian rail network, which will hopefully be uh, a greener alternative to the highway network. And another thing they've been doing right now is running a lot of China Railway Express freight as in cargo trains to Europe. There was one that went all the way to Barking, just on the outskirts of London some years back. <laughs> And I think obviously that's say that's an adventurous thing, but it's also a very green thing, because rail is going to be faster than shipping, and it's going to involve less carbon dioxide exhausted than if you just flew it over by plane. So it's going to be a new way to get goods from A to B across continents. Hasn't been so much affected by the novel coronavirus this time because it's mostly carrying items rather than people. Eventually you would also start a new network carrying people across Eurasia as well. And those which are consider- considerably faster than, say, the current Trans-Siberian, trans manchuria Yeah, I, I, like the whole idea of the Trans-Siberian Railway taking four days seems like a complete farce. Or just very, I don't know, very Republican era, if we want to go it's back about, to that. 
It's about a week, actually. It's about a week. As much as a train guy I am, I don't think I'll be taking train K3 from Beijing to Moscow, even after Corona, on a regular basis. Once or twice with family, that's always going to be a unique experience. But I don't think I'll be doing Zuri to Beijing via Moscow and via Germany using the train so much, except for if I've got really a lot of time to burn. The game changer is if they, int is, is if they introduce high-speed services across Eurasia, which I personally hope is going to happen because you want to make travel greener and this whole thing, especially in China and across Europe now, it's more people are train shaming. They're like, why would you fly between Beijing to Shanghai from London to Paris when you can have a fast train connection? So we've already discussed how the, the Chinese train quality is basically at or even in some measures exceeding what uh, Western and other East Asian countries can produce. What is the sort of like bang for your buck, the, the, price, the price point at which these Chinese firms can make, can make trains and how does that compare to what's in the West? The construction, I don't think, is going to be too much of an issue because it's, I would say, and I'm not parroting Beijing here, but I think it's a reasonably fact-based statement that... Uh, Getting Chinese companies to create your railway line is going to be more affordable than if you chose like other companies from other countries. That's like a fact. But then again, I personally have heard horror stories in China about local construction, sometimes cutting corners. Let's just pray it's not going to happen overseas, because if it does happen overseas, it's going to be a really tragic thing. It's going to be a loss. It's pretty much going to... People are going to be like, okay, China builds stuff, but it's not of great quality, so why bother? I think actually, when it comes to... If they really take the effort to build the railways with care, and I am actually... I'm seeing more and more of this, and I think they are making an effort. Then people will basically be like, okay, why don't we consider China for building our high-speed network or our uh, classic rail network? And I think they've got the experience. They've built railway lines through basically all the way up to close to uh, quasi Tundra territory in the northeast. They've even done the Qinghai Tibet Railway. They're starting now on a second route, this time from Chengdu to Tibet. They've built railway lines on uh, tropical summer, like tropical islands, say Hainan. They've built pretty much rail networks across major conurbations. China has the experience. It's always good to start bidding when you've got the experience. Sure. Let's do a little bit on, on Beijing subway system. Yeah. Uh, what do you think are the most remarkable aspects of it? And what lessons can other cities learn from what Beijing has been able to accomplish in the past uh, few decades? I think as someone who's been on the entire network in terms of visiting all stations, been on all lines so far, I think it is a network that uh, is a grower because we started out with less than 100 kilometers. And uh, in fact, the first line was like a merger of what's now lines one and two. So the really old line ran from Beijing Railway Station all the way to the western suburbs. Back then it was just simply one line, not too much. Back then it was a massive achievement, but today it would be microscopic. Instead, what we have today is a uh, quasi 700 kilometer long network uh, made up of trams, made up of quasi light rail trains, but also heavy rail trains, eight car trains that can you know carry about thousands of people on board and a massive network. So I think it's a, uh, I think the Beijing subway, if anything, is like the rail, the metro solution to Beijing's traffic woes. Beijing has been limiting the number of cars on, allowed on its public roads so that 20% of cars are blocked. And that's been the case since I think uh, the late 2000s. Back then it made little sense, but now with a 700 kilometer, quasi 700 kilometer urban rail network, Sometimes it makes no sense to start We're shifting around during traffic peak hour in your car. Why can't you take the tube? I think it's a far faster way to get from A to B. And you also get to avoid the agony of like waiting five, ten, even half an hour for your DD. Sure. Let's do some, uh, anything else on, is there anything else on like trains and industrial policy we should hit? Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll go to my fun ones. Uh, I think the incentive in China right now, not merely the incentive, but what's happening right now is we're shifting from a uh, massively highway and road-based transport policy to a uh, rail-based tra transport policy. And it's not just a Chinese thing. And I think it's, it shows its, its applications in different ways. As a Swiss citizen, I see this happening across Switzerland as well. 
we've built a lot of tunnels so that we encourage cross-boundary freight to use rail is like the highways and we allow high-speed rail to basically shorten journeys from Zurich to Milan by pretty much an hour and in China the same is happening but to massive new extents when we open up the high-speed line from Guangzhou to Wuhan the usual 11-hour classic rail journey became a three to four hour super express journey that slashed more than 50 percent of travel times and i think that is a massive chief that that is a massive but also a very green achievement what's the most interesting amenity you've seen in a train station this thing that i really have something not much so much against them but i just find it to be rather pointless driving cars into station concourses and advertising them (laughs) <laughs> Why would you want to drive a car when uh, when right underneath the concourse are trains running up to 350 kilometers per hour? You're trying to shift into sixth gear on the German <laughs> motorways, the Autobahn. The fastest I've done there is just 248. The high-speed trains in China are 400 kilometers per hour faster than that. Why would you want a little bit of 20th century technology when you get 21st century technology like right underneath the concourse? So that I'm with you, I... David. I love it. Yeah. So sometimes I see cars at station concourse. I'm like, what's the point, really? Could you contrast sort of rail riding culture and sort of passenger expectations of Europe versus China? I think in Europe, rail is much more accessible because you have tickets that are good on any rail service. The idea of just turning up and go is is slightly more alien China, although eating has made it much more accessible. On a few lines now, you can actually buy, well, if you're a Chinese citizen, that is a a stored value electronic ticket, and you can use that as like virtually a subway. Obviously not on national high-speed rail, but more like for local intercity services, and that works as well. A few train services work even with a public transport card, like those in Beijing to Bartling, and a few select lines in Shanghai. The idea of just turning up and go without buying a ticket half an hour or even half a day or half a week in advance it's something new it's uh, slowly happening but i think in europe the train is used a lot more david could you talk a little bit about the chinglish that you've come across in yeah. chinese on the chinese rail system and what you've done to to upgrade that how that process has gone i think it got itself a pre- a pretty crazy start when I was at Bartling Station and I was greeted with a sign which in Chinese said, go to Platform 2 for trains to Beijing North. And in English, said something completely different. It mixed up Pinyin with Beijing and got the directions wrong. It made sense and perfect sense in Chinese. It made zero sense in English. And I'm like, hey, this is somewhere where visitors from all over the world come. And it's not so much losing face for China in terms of how locals would frame it as I'm like a visitor and I have no idea what the hell you're telling me. So after I got myself a teaching job at the university in 2012, I thought I'm a trained guy. I'm also an English academic as a lecturer back then. And I, it makes sense to improve English for the, the companies, the things close to you that you care a lot about and where there is a considerable outside patronage by uh, expats so back then i decided okay let me launch something let me take the situation to my own hands and launch this uh, movement called everyday or called everyday rail english and it gained traction quickly all the major stations were like okay this is how we do signage and then i was like retweeting things and saying okay this is how you do it the right way i started doing bilingual rail posts over on weibo people like that and then eventually it got to the stage where the rails were like saying okay you've done all that stuff this is great we'd like you to come to our station take a look at our signage and if you can give us a lesson on how to do things the right way back at the beginning the standards that i did the standards the railways did were just completely random it was just mixed up there would be american english british english chinglish pinyin hansa all over the place mixed up into one standards document nobody knew what the heck the thing was from head to tail and um, in the about i would say six or seven years since i was doing this kind of stuff we've defaulted to mainly uk english we've uh, decided to basically standardize how things work standardized in many different ways a particular function of a railway station was the signposted and uh, made it a lot more easy and a lot more accessible 
and we've also decided to introduce English onto the station、uh, signage, basically at platform level, to tell people to mind the gap, to not smoke, and things like that. And slowly, it's picking up steam. Right now, it's pretty much、yeah. still early days, but hopefully, it's going to work. It, it is a really heartwarming story, and on the one hand, everyone likes to giggle at. Particularly clever translations, like you said, stop mouth for entrance to platforms. Yeah, makes, yeah, make, which makes a lot of sense in Chinese. But at the same time, you can see how the Baidu translation went wrong or whatever. But well, you know, the translation, is, the famous translate server、yeah. error. Server error. That's、stuff. a good one too. But like yeah. chuko, yeah, it's cold. Yeah, it's a mouth. But, yeah, that yeah. That doesn't work. We're people. We're not things. Come on, you、yeah. can get that right. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, it is a bit of a, a heartwarming story. The、yeah. the the way in which that this the railway station and the station managers have welcomed your your advice. Yeah, in fact, if you travel by rail to Jinan West Railway Station, all the English is、um, from a certain. I'd say one of us in front of a microphone did this pretty much for the benefit of the traveling public who don't speak any Chinese. David, could you tell some anecdotes about the the process of interacting with these、uh, rail officials all across China? When I give lessons, I tell them that English is not the end of the world because there are some languages even more difficult than English. Basically, let's say you're traveling on train ninety seven or train G ninety seven rather. So in Chinese, it's just straightforward, just simply Jiao Shi Qi, so nine ten seven. In English, it's pretty much the same as well. But、uh, in French, in metropolitan France, that's the hard bit because you have to say. Quatre vingt dix sept. So basically, four times twenty plus ten plus seven. And in German, it's a six, which is seven plus ninety. So by the time rail crew hear that, they're like, "Okay, English is still pretty difficult, but it's not as hard as I thought." <laughs> yeah, I I have sort of nothing but positive anecdotes about my interactions with ticket sellers who've been creative and trying to get me where to where I want to go. And as a foreigner, like buying tickets, I think until very recently was. A bit of a pain, and you had to print them out and get there early、yeah. and stand in line with everyone who doesn't have a Huko、right. card or something. Oh, with an ID card.、Um, yeah, but but at the same time, I feel like it's、um, my window of interacting with Chinese trains was twenty seventeen to twenty twenty. But in terms of cu- customer service,、yeah. I've always been impressed. I remembered when I was at Harbin Railway Station in late twenty eleven, trying to get a train ticket, waiting one hour in line. That was a that was a bloody long wait, I just say. But in terms of interaction with rail people, I've、uh, come across a few members of staff who really did take their job seriously. Some who were like outright humorous, but also learned the way that the rail system worked in China. Because everyone wears the same rail uniform with the rail logo, you think they come from one massive state-owned company. There's only that much of a truth behind that, because the train people that bring you from Beijing to Shanghai come from five different rail. Units, so to speak. The driver comes from a locomotive depot. The、uh, train crew on board, rail crew on board, come from either passenger rail services or from the dining car unit. The people that adjust air conditioning basically come from the maintenance unit, and station staff come from one of eleven、uh, station units on the twenty-four station line between Beijing and Shanghai on high speed. So it's really complicated and.、Uh, Sometimes when I do rail English for these people, I make a point. I have to do it for train crew and for station crew. And、uh, when I did the book in 2017, Everyday Rail English, 1,000 Phrases, I made it so that one book would work for both rail crew and station crew because it's essential that you get the same norm of English both on board and off board, and on board and、uh, off trains as well. So, where else in the train ecosystem would you be interested in working? I would stay outside of official rail bodies, although I would certainly see myself involved in a worldwide. I how do I say this? Like capacity advocating rail transport pretty much across continents, across countries, regions, and across cities as well. I'm a big proponent of personal、uh, rail transport. Like the the next time you fly to London Heathrow, ideally after the coronavirus outbreak. Go to Terminal Five and then take the the basically the personal metro between Terminal Five, the the terminal building, and、uh, the nearby car park. It's basically a four person personal metro train. And I was like thinking, if we had that in future, instead of driving from one part of town to the other, if we had this personal train, then this would be a, a game changer. And also, I see myself doing what I do right now in terms of a rail documentary. Uh, basically, introducing countries, communities, cities,、uh, regions, continents 
simply by uh, starting from the rail network. Because from that, you can see urbanization in full swing. Like one of the textbook examples is Wuqing railway station between Beijing and Tianjin on the Intercity line. When it opened in 2008, it was like right in the middle of nowhere. Three years afterwards, there was one shopping center next to it. Right now, you get a mile of inter of like activity, high rises, shop 